It's uh, my great pleasure and honor to introduce our uh, first speaker of the day, um, Zahid Hassan from uh, Princeton University. Zahid uh, actually told me that he went to the same high school in India as S.N. Bose. And all weekend I was trying to figure out what the odds for that are. Um, of course, here in Israel, when we say we went to the same high school as some famous Israeli, it doesn't mean a lot because it's a small country. Of course, I'm sure that just dividing by the population is not the right way of calculating it. So maybe someone can work it out later. Anyway, he's uh, lived in the U.S. Uh, since a young age. He did his Ph.D. at uh, Stanford University, um, working mainly at Slack. And uh, he uh, has been at uh, Princeton University since 2002, first as a Dickey Fellow. That's a very prestigious fellowship for uh, postdocs. But he was a postdoc only for about three months, and then he became a faculty member at Princeton University. Now he's an associate professor there, um, and I'm very, very happy to uh, introduce him. And he'll be telling us, I think, about one of the hottest topics in the last few years, at least in condensed matter physics. So thank you, Zahid. Thank you. Uh, I, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be uh, presenting here, and uh, I, I, I start out thanking IPS for having me over here. So I'll talk about uh, this topological phases of matter from a broad point of view, from starting from how it fits into the uh, uh, broad scale of physics. Okay. So uh, as we, most of us, most of us would know that uh, broken symmetry is a key concept in physics. I mean, it's all over physics. We define new interactions, new fundamental forces or particles based on some spontaneously broken symmetry. And uh, just as in particle physics, we have all these particles and forces uh, in condensed matter physics, we, ha we, we deal with the phases of matter, distinct phases of matter, and uh, that could vary from solid, liquid to gas, or say electronic phases of matter such as magnet or superconductors. So over the last few years, there is this uh, new development that is it possible to have phase of matter or particles that does not necessarily involve a broken symmetry. So it's, it's a paradigm shifting thinking both in particle physics and in condensed matter physics. So uh, just as LHC will be asking questions, what, is, uh, what, what, is, what, are, what sorts of physics lie beyond the standard model? Uh, think of in terms of topological field theories like string theories are their signatures of supersymmetry. In condensed matter physics, we also think about uh, are there topological states of matter that uh, does not involve a broken symmetry. So topological insulator is one such example that uh, it is a distinct phase of matter that does not involve a broken symmetry. So coming uh, start from physics to condensed matter physics, uh, we, uh, we have to, we, in condensed matter physics, there is, no standard, there is no standard model as it is in the particle physics. Uh, in particle physics, the paradigm shifting questions are often, is there physics beyond the standard model? In condensed matter physics, we ask, is there physics beyond the standard paradigm? which uh, in condensed matter physics, which is a set of concepts that developed from mostly from observations like uh, quantum Hall effect, quantization of uh, Hall conductivity, superfluidity or superconductivity, magnetism and phase transition. So these, these concepts sort of uh, uh, define the paradigm of condensed matter physics. So then we can ask this question, what are the concepts, what are the ideas that will take us beyond the condensed matter, uh, beyond this standard paradigm? So one simple, uh, so we can ask a set of questions. So one such question in, uh, in the quantum Hall physics is, is it possible to get 
quantum Hall-like effect without applying a magnetic field, without an applied magnetic field. And uh, so more technical way of asking these questions, are there topological states of matter beyond the quantum Hall effect? And then it has its, so the starting question, if you think of it as a million dollar question, then you can ask harder questions uh, that worth probably a billion. So uh, can we utilize this type of topological phases of matter to do something useful like say quantum computing in a fault tolerant way or topological quantum computing? So we can ask similar questions, is there uh, uh, beyond superconductivity, is there superconductivity beyond the standard BCS uh, paradigm? Is, there, is it possible to have superconductivity without a pairing glue? Or we could also ask, is there, are there ways to get higher temperature superconductivity, say even up to room temperature, without the copper oxide paradigm? Are there new ways of raising TC? Uh, so on and so forth. You can ask similar questions in the field of magnetism or uh, 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 phase transitions. Is phase transition possible at zero temperature? And are there new universality classes? So this particular talk will focus on the first topic that, uh, so I'll try to address, is it possible to have quantum Hall-like effect without magnetic field? And the broader question is, are there new topological phases of matter? Although in my research, I tend to address all these uh, questions in red, but the focus will be on the first question. So let me start out thanking my, acknowledging my students and collaborators, uh, David, Dong, Andrew, Yuki, Suyang, they're the core team. Uh, and uh, for Crystal Growth, we work with Bob Kava's group at Princeton, and on the theory side, we work with a, uh, a group of theorists all over the country, uh, especially Shin Lin, Bansil, Kane, Moore, and Barnevik. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll try to address the topology issue how, uh, from, mostly from the experimental side, uh, with a brief introduction to the theoretical aspect of it, but from a very broad point of view, Topology is something that describes, uh, it, it's, it's classically, there is a classical definition of topology of closed surfaces. And when we think of topology, we think of Gaussian curvature and geodesic curvature. But how, how do uh, these concepts apply to electronic materials, world of material science, or condensed matter physics? So the, uh, the, uh, the mindset here is to think of the uh, Fourier space of electronic states in solids uh, as, a, as a set of manifold, a closed surface, and then is it possible to define some sort of invariance similar to the classical definition of topology, uh, invariance that uh, uh, in terms of the Berry phase, in terms of the electronic structure, motion of electrons in a closed manifold. So, so uh, in terms of experiments, how topology entered the experimental world is through the Hall effect. And uh, most of us would recognize the classical Hall effect in the sense that when we apply a magnetic field, a transverse voltage would develop. And the, Hall if the classical Hall effect is is as uh, this Hall resistance grow, grows linearly uh, with the magnetic field. And, uh, and this, is, this is a standard setting in almost every uh, condensed matter physics lab. We use this tool uh, to measure the uh, uh, carry, number of carriers or the sign of carriers in a, in a, in a metal. Okay, so now if I crank up the magnetic field then in a strong magnetic field, the metallic uh, spectrum, the spectrum of the metal would, would form discrete levels. And this is the classic uh, 
uh, textbook quantum mechanics problem, if you put electrons in a strong magnetic field, you can get the discrete energy levels. In more technical terms, you get Landau levels. So the idea is, uh, what if my Fermi level, which is chemical potential, or the Fermi level, which is set by the number of particles in the system, falls in between the discrete levels? Then the, based on the energy structure, it looks like I have, a, uh, I have an insulator, a band insulator with a gap. So uh, the question to ask here, is this band insulator same as the band insulator we know in silicon or gallium arsenide? Is this band insulator, uh, 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 or this is fundamentally different from the known band insulators in, in, in standard materials? So this question was answered uh, uh, in, in a series of experiments. Uh, but conceptually, conceptually, we can think of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, think of the, think of characterizing such insulators in, term, in, uh, in terms of hull conductivity or uh, going back to the fundamentals when we apply a magnetic field, we have a, uh, electrons go around it. And on the edge of, of a two-dimensional sample, uh, electrons can form skipping orbits. So these skipping orbits can connect on the boundary. Although the bulk of the matter is insulating, there is a band gap. On the boundary, there can be a current uh, flowing. There is a, there is a, there is a current, a current, there is a channel for the current to flow through the boundary. So this channel uh, is responsible for the finite hull conductivity, although the electronic structure is that of an insulator. So this is the first example of what now we might call a topological insulator, that uh, a topological insulator is insulating in the bulk, but it can conduct electricity on the boundary. And this is, uh, and when the magnetic field is very strong, then the transfer of electrons from the bulk to the boundary is, dis I mean, those, uh, th those transfers can be visualized in the data in the sense that this, this is happening in steps. So this is the quantum Hall regime where we can observe how many electrons are being transferred from the bulk to the boundary. So in other words, uh, the existing quantum Hall effect is already a form of topological insulator. And so what is the, so this is sort of the conceptual framework, but there is a more precise formulation that I can write the Hall conductivity or Hall conductance in terms of the fundamental quantities, electron charge and the uh, Planck's constant. And, uh, uh, and this N, which is the quantum of the uh, conductivity, quantum of the quantum Hall effect, is it has a profound interpretation in terms of the topology of the Hilbert space of that system. So this was realized uh, by uh, David Thaules and collaborators. This is technically uh, this paper, TKNN invariants. So, so the idea is to make a connection to the, the, this is how topology entered into the picture, that the number of, uh, the quantum of Hall conductance is a topological quantum number in the sense that it only depends how many electrons are carrying current on the boundary. It only depends on the uh, electronic structure of the bulk. In other words, what is happening in the boundary is a, some sort of holographic image of the bulk. And this is different from, the, uh, uh, from most of the age behavior we observe in ordinary materials. On the, when I terminate a material, uh, then I get a surface or an edge, and there can be dangling bonds or some sort of electronic reconstruction. That can also give me conducting states on the boundary. But what this theorem or this connection is telling us is that uh, there is a new type of edge states which cannot be 
deleted, uh, which cannot be destroyed without destroying the topology of the bulk Hilbert space. So this is, this is the uh, idea of topologically protected edge states. In other words, uh, until and unless I totally change the Hilbert space of the sample, meaning, meaning uh, I make a drastic deformation of the uh, uh, material or the crystal, I cannot change the properties, uh, property of the, of the edge, edge states, uh, the electrons that uh, form this uh, Hall current. So, uh, so why is this exciting? This is exciting because early on it was realized that this Hull conductive quantization is extremely precise. It's one parts in a billion. So the reason it's uh, so extreme, uh, so highly, uh, so extremely precise is uh, is this connection that it's set by the topological properties of the Hilbert space, not by the details of the crystal potential on the boundary. Uh, we know in physics, uh, mostly, uh, physical property of a system is determined by the details of the potential. If I change the potential, then the physical property would change. And the idea of topologically protected properties are, uh, uh, are that it's, it depends on the topology of the m uh, manifold of states rather than the uh, potential. So, so this is exciting in terms of uh, in terms of uh, potential applications for uh, 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 fault-tolerant way of uh, fault-tolerant computation or topological computation. So in this case, the environment itself is providing that protection from dephasing. So this is why it's so exciting to find new forms of topological states of matter where the excitations are connected to the topology and uh, resistance to uh, small deformations or changes in the sample. So the next uh, important concept that, uh, that came into the field was in late 80s uh, by Duncan Holden, who thought of a model, uh, he, uh, he constructed a theoretical model where he could demonstrate that you, one can think of topological protection without an applied magnetic field. So the, the model he started, uh, he wrote down is, uh, is that of uh, uh, on a honeycomb lattice, electrons in a honeycomb lattice with alternating field, but the net magnetic field is zero. So as we know now, I mean, if you solve the graphene lattice or honeycomb lattice, uh, you get a Dirac point that's a bulk band structure. And that by itself is interesting. I mean, graphene is all, uh, there is so much interesting uh, 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 aspect about graphene. So in this case, if you turn on this uh, fictitious field uh, with that field being zero uh, and solve this model, it turns out it has a finite hull conductivity, uh, uh, plus minus one. So in this case, so this was the first example of a topological insulator, but then uh, there is no how do I find a real interaction in a real solid which will give me such, uh, uh, such alternating field? So thinking along that line, uh, uh, around 2005 or four and five, people thought of, uh, 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 of spin orbit interaction uh, as a potential source of internal magnetic field. So spin-orbit interaction is a relativistic term, and uh, so it depends on the so the so the electrons in its the electric field in the crystal would look like a magnetic field in the electron's own rest frame, and it the direction of the field will depend on the direction of motion, so velocity-dependent field. So one can think of uh, the effect of strong spin-orbit interaction as a combination of two quantum Hall system, field up, spin up, and field down, spin down. So if I put them together, I can get rid of the field. My net field is zero, but I have edge current, uh, uh, counter-propagating edge current. So this is, this is a nice idea, but the problem is that in this case, this counter-propagating edge current will give me zero Hall conductance. 
So if the Hall conductance is zero, then my topological quantum number n is also zero. So then I do not have, I can get a, get edge states like that, but they will not be topologically protected because my churn number, topological quantum number is also zero. So this was the puzzle around that time. Uh, and a number of theorists came up with the idea that how to find a new topological protection law so that, uh, uh, or whether there is, there do exist any new uh, protection law that could save these edge states. In other words, how to go beyond the churn number protection of quantum Hall states. So, uh, so this, uh, this was first introduced by Kane and Milley uh, in 2005 and subsequently by Barnevig, Zan and, and many others. So there the idea is that instead of thinking of churn number, think of churn parity. So the invariant, the topological invariant, will be written in terms of the parity of the block wave function. So playing with the block parity of the block wave functions, they could construct a topological invariant. So, uh, so that led to the experimental identification of mercury telluride quantum wells having this type of edge structure. So what is exciting about this experiment that this type of edge states are stable. So this is a transport experiment by Mollenkamp Group in 2007 that demonstrated that this is not just theoretical concept that you can uh, you co combine to uh, combine a pair of quantum Hall states and get rid of the magnetic field and get the uh, counter-propagating edge states, but they are stable. Uh, but the, a totally new surprise came around 2007 when it was realized that uh, although there is no three-dimensional generalization of quantum Hall state, of the old quantum Hall state, but thinking along this churn parity line, there are uh, topological states in three dimensions. And these topological states do not show a quantum spin Hall behavior. And so that's, uh, so, uh, so one had to pick a new term, and that's how the term topological insulator came in, because we cannot call them quantum spin Hall state, because they do not show a quantum spin Hall behavior. So, so the rest of my talk will uh, demonstrate what is this topological insulator and what is their edge behavior, what is their surface or boundary behavior, and why is this, uh, what are the potential applications or what new physics is behind this uh, three-dimensional topological insulators. So uh, incidentally, I, my group was also working on this, some of these Bismuth-based materials, and we were uh, initially annoyed by the fact that they have boundary protected surface state, which we could not get rid of. So at that time, we were not aware of these theoretical developments, and I presented some results in KITP, and then uh, theorists were all excited about it. So we found a new interpretation of the annoying results, which turned out to be very exciting. And more recent development is that, unlike the quantum Hall states, these uh, three-dimensional or bulk topological insulators, they can be turned into superconductors to, uh, and, or magnets. And this, uh, this, this is a very exciting development because now the quantum Hall type physics and superconductivity and magnetism, which is the mainstream condensed matter physics, they're merging to find totally new physics. So uh, uh, subsequently, uh, there are many uh, new developments uh, 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 on, on the three-dimensional topological insulators. They are superconducting and magnet versions. And currently, there are about 500 papers in the last two years on, on this topic. So, uh, so now the question is, how do I prove that we found a new type of topological insulator in bulk materials? And so the challenge is to identify the topological quantum number. Uh, and we go back and look, look how, what was the experimental signature 
that quantum Hall states are topological. So there, as, as I showed, that this quantum number, the churn number that counts the edge states, is the topological quantum number. So if I, if I can measure these, uh, these ends, these churn numbers, I, 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 I have a measure of the, I have identified the phase. So in some way, it's like, uh, it's like superconductivity finding uh, how to define the superconducting state with its order parameter. So these numbers are, in some way, are order parameters of that new state. So once I know all the components, all the topological quantum numbers, I have uniquely defined a topological state. And uh, so how do I do that? in terms of when there is no churn number, because topological insulators have zero churn number, uh, but they have parity. So one possibility is to look at, uh, search through the materials and measure the parities of all possible wave functions. So that's, a, that's a, of, that, of that system. In other words, uh, have an exhaustive mapping of its Hilbert space. So this is, this is uh, unrealistic. Uh, but there is a way to uh, get these topological quantum numbers that will uniquely define that particular state. So in three dimensions, this, uh, there are four topological quantum numbers that define a state that leads to 16 different types of insulators. So one of them, when these quantum numbers, all four components are zeros, I get a conventional insulator, that's like my silicon or gallium arsenide. And the 15 others, they have non-zero components and, uh, of this uh, uh, quantum number, and this, this, this number is telling us uh, what is the nature, topological nature of that state. And unlike the quantum Hall states, the transport is not necessarily quantized, so I cannot do a transport measurement to define these topological states. So the approach I have taken is, uh, uh, so far it seems to be the only approach to measure this uh, topological quantum number, is that I go uh, look at, I go to the boundary of the sample and look what electrons are doing, and I go to the bulk of the sample and look what electrons are doing. So in other words, I'm doing a spin-sensitive momentum resolve measurement of the bulk and the edge. And so just as in the quantum Hall case, if I know what is happening on the boundary, I can define the churn number, topological quantum number. In this case, I can do the same. Uh, so it is a more direct measurement. Okay, so the experimental setup is the standard, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's the modern version of the photoelectric effect, Einstein's photoelectric effect. So photon comes in and uh, excites the, uh, knocks out an electron, and then the electron, we measure the energy, momentum, and spin of the electron. So I know all the quantum numbers of the individual electron that was moving in the, in the, inside the sample. So, so then uh, this exhaustive mapping gives me all the details of the system. So the spin part is, uh, is a relatively new development. So uh, the way the detector works is the, is, is, uh, is the classic Mott scattering. So uh, I, I can utilize the spin orbit interaction of, the, of a target to isolate the spins. So this is like a uh, Hall effect of spins. So in other words, I'm using spin Hall effect to isolate this, uh, to measure the spin degrees of freedom. So you might wonder why, uh, why don't I use the standard uh, uh, textbook stern garlock experiment to measure the spin. So stern garlock experiment works very well when you're dealing with Neutral, neutral particles. For charged particles, uh, isolating uh, the spin components is a terribly uh, daunting task. And uh, it turns out doing that using a spin Hall effect or Mott scattering is much more efficient. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, I'm showing data on uh, bismuth antimony insulators. 
So they have, uh, uh, so, they, so by looking at the energy, change in energy, uh, we, can, we can look whether the, we, we can measure the electronic state, uh, all, it's all three momentum components. So then if we look at the, if we see if the, if the uh, so the idea is if one of the momentum components, the momentum component that is perpendicular to the surface, if the energy of the electron does not depend on the momentum component that is perpendicular to the surface, uh, so that would tell us that the electron is, uh, it has a two-dimensional uh, wave packet. If, if, the, if, the, if it is changing in the third dimension, then it is a three-dimensional wave. So this is the idea. By changing energy, uh, we isolate the, uh, isolate the from, the, from the total signal, we isolate the electronic uh, spectral functions, electronic behavior that are two-dimensional as opposed to three-dimensional. So this is just like measuring the dispersion relation of a wave packet. Uh, okay. So if we do that, what happens is that uh, starting with an insulator, we see that the bulk band, it has a gap. That means it is a, a, a band insulator, but on the surface, it has a Fermi surface. In other words, the surface is metallic, although the bulk is insulating. So now, uh, now the idea is, so uh, now the idea is, is this surface, surface state are, uh, are like the generalizations of the quantum Hall state or it's something else, or it is a trivial metallic surface on the, uh, uh, that is realized by, say, dangling bond or reconstruction of the surface. So that's the next challenge. So in order to do that, we use the parity argument, uh, the theoretical argument by Fu and Cain, that if, uh, if, I, if I take two time reversal, these streams, uh, time reversal invariant momenta. If I take a pair of time reversal invariant momenta on the surface, then uh, and uh, and walk from one point to the other, if surface states cross the Fermi level odd number of times, then the parity product, that churn parity of the whole system, is odd. And if it is even, then the churn parity is even. In, the, in other words, it's trivial. So uh, it sounds like a trivial uh, test, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's fairly profound when one would actually search through the literature of surface state and see that all known surface states are, they come in pairs. Uh, if we isolate a pair of uh, time reversal invariant momenta, so in rare cases, the crossing happens odd number of times. So when it happens odd number of times, then we get a non-trivial a system that has non-trivial churn parity. So this is the first set of data on bismuth antimony in, uh, semiconductors. Uh, there is a Fermi surface, uh, and you can see that between the gamma and M, there, is, there are five bands crossing the Fermi level. So this is the first indication that something is strange about these bismuth uh, materials. So, but it becomes more clear when we look at the, we, we assign the spins. So by do, making the, by detecting the spins, we start to assign how, we start to look how spins go around as I go around the Fermi surface. So what we see is the, uh, the central Fermi surface, the circle you see, spins only rotate on the central Fermi surface. And if I go around other pockets, like these petal-shaped pockets, the spins, they do not change direction. So now if I want to calculate the uh, transport property on this surface, then uh, I, can, uh, I can use this spin rotation argument so that's the generalized Berry phase argument, which actually came from Aronoff Bohm uh, phase argument uh, in the solid state case. That uh, uh, if I go around, 
uh, in a closed circle, if the spin rotates by 360 degree, I get a pi Berry phase as opposed to 2 pi because spin is this SU2 object. So I have to rotate the spin by three, 720 degree to get the full, uh, to get the wave function map onto itself. So the wave function develops a, uh, picks up a negative sign as I go around 360 degree. So this is very, very unusual. If you know of surface states, go look in the literature and see it never happens that you have a pi Berry phase on the surface. So the, what is the central electronic feature? What is the electronic dispersion relation that gives me that Berry phase? So one can see that its origin is, uh, is a crossing that looks like a Dirac crossing at the center of the Brion zone where, where the bands cross, at the center of the Fermi surface. So, uh, so it, for low energies, Near the crossing where, where the red and blue bands cross, there would be a, uh, I can effectively define a Dirac cone. And this Dirac cone carries, uh, then I, if I look at the spins, uh, the Dirac cone carries a pi Berry phase. So uh, from, from experiments, we can measure the spin orientation angle in three dimensions with respect to the tangent to the Fermi surface and that can give us a more accurate uh, value of the Berry phase. Uh, Berry, one can also measure Berry phase in a transport way, but so far uh, it's, uh, those experiments are very difficult, the interference experiments. Uh, they, they will be done in future. So uh, this idea of Berry phase and identification that a central Dirac cone is, uh, is key to this uh, topological churn parity uh, so are there, uh, are there ways to find other materials? Are there other materials that have similar uh, central piece of physics? Uh, in other words, uh, in, in the first compound, we had, the, we had a flower uh, petal Fermi surface. I had, we had a central cone. We also had other satellite Fermi surfaces. Uh, is it possible to get rid of the other? Uh, Fermi surfaces because they do not contribute to the Berry phase. And then in that case, I'll be left with a single Dirac cone. This is how, by searching around other bismuth materials, we found that bismuth selenide has almost ideal uh, single Dirac cone. Uh, so then by looking at the uh, spins on this Dirac cone, we see that uh, above the Dirac point or the Dirac node, spins go clockwise. But if we go below the Dirac node, then it, it, it will change chirality. It goes anti-clockwise. So that confirms that uh, uh, it, it is a global churn parity that is odd in this system. So uh, the chirality inversion through the Dirac node is, is a decisive signature that these are topologically non-trivial materials. So why is this uh, interesting, or why, what, what are the unique surface properties these uh, materials should feature? And uh, from a transport point of view, if I may uh, measure conductivity or resistivity or other transport properties, how would they differ from other two-dimensional electron gas? Because uh, we know a whole lot about 2D electron gases. So how these two-dimensional surface states uh, differ from uh, the known 2D electron gas. So one way to think about it is that if I, if I, uh, if uh, uh, based on this uh, this uh, this uh, spin resolve measurements, what we see is that let's say I have a I have an electron moving to the its wave packet is moving to the right at say point one, so it's k plus moving to the right. Its spin is based on the data. Its spin is down, and if if the electron moving to the left, then its spin is up. So, in other words, uh, a right mover on topological surfaces, uh, the right mover is uh, and the left mover have opposite. They have opposite spins. So, this is spin momentum locking. That if I know that some, uh, a particular electron, it's moving to the right, its spin will be down. 
uh, and then the, I know that the left mover will have up spin. So uh, this is also telling us that I have half the degrees of freedom in the system because in a normal regular 2D electron gas, I have two right movers and two left movers, and I have both spins. Even if I have spin orbit interaction, they can be split. So, so immediately we see that uh, this, the topological insulator surfaces have half the Fermi gas. So half of the degrees of freedom are missing, which uh, then necessarily leads to a spin momentum locking. Okay, so this is something we confirm by experiment. Uh, in lower dimension, in mercury telluride, that is what is meant by quantum spin Hall effect. So in three dimensions, so this is happening in all directions in 2D, so there is no obvious way to define a spin Hall effect, but if I take a slice through my data, then it would look like quantum spin Hall effect. Okay, so then these materials can be uh, tuned further to make them look like graphene. This is what I called, uh, I call them topological graphene in this particular paper that you could uh, get the chemical potential to lie at the Dirac point, which in this case is also the Kramer's point. So uh, in principle, they should behave like graphene. So, uh, so, so, so far to summarize what is happening is that, uh, so these materials have non-trivial churn parity uh, which is a topological invariant, and this invariant is very similar to the classical expression for topological uh, uh, number defined in, in topology. And in physics, it manifests itself as uh, having the surface having uh, pi Berry phase or odd Berry phase. And, uh, and uh, so if I look at the... And, and different materials can have different uh, geometrical, I mean, the materials, the Fermi surface can have different geometrical configurations of spins. So if you like, the difference between topology and geometry is that I have different geometrical objects may belong to the same topology class. A coffee cup and a donut uh, belong to the same topology class. They both have a hole through it. So this spin texture how spins are arranged and the Fermi surface details, they are like geometrical variations. But what is the physical topological invariant I'm seeing here? That's when I track the electron wave function, that no matter how complex the Fermi surface geometry is, uh, end of the day, I have pi Berry phase. So this is, uh, so this is the topology, and uh, this is the topological invariant of the system. So this is a consequence of the churn parity. Okay, so now going back to the quantum hall, uh, quantum hall effect is uh, inherently two-dimensional. Now I can try to stack the quantum hall layers and make a surface state, but that's not a new topological state, and that surface state is not protected. So quantum hall, by the, the mathematical nature of churn number, uh, there is no, it has no three-dimensional uh, analog that is a distinct phase of matter. In case of topological insulators, I have, I have both, there is a 2D analog, so, uh, so in 2D I can think of it as a, uh, uh, a combination of two quantum Hall states, spin up, spin down, then I, uh, my net field is zero, I have counter-propagating edge state, but 3D can be very, very uh, 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 unique and novel. So there is, uh, so topological insulators, the 3D version is really a totally new uh, uh, playground for physics. So, so far, I, uh, I showed complex Fermi surfaces, but I also showed Dirac cones, and I argued that uh, a sim single Dirac cone is the list you should have to get a topological insulator, although that's not required. Uh, you can have more complex Fermi surfaces. But we also have seen uh, in condensed matter physics, we also have graphene showing us Dirac cone, right? So what is the difference? So difference is profound and 
there is a very fundamental difference. In graphene, uh, the, the, the duracon is a consequence of the bulk band structure. If I solve the uh, bulk band structure with a tight binding or any sort of uh, simple electronic model, I'll get Dirac cone. Uh, on topological insulators, the bulk band structure is gapped. I have a band gap in the system, and the band gap is due to spin orbit interaction. So that spin orbit gap is like a Landau level of the system, if you like, uh, and the Dirac cone is a topological property. It's a, it's a consequence of uh, the topology of, the, of its Hilbert space. And uh, uh, the idea here is that uh, it's, it's a purely boundary effect. It's an image of the topology of the, uh, it's a surface projection of the to unusual topology of the bulk. So, uh, and these Dirac cones in topological insulators, they are, uh, they, one can also think of them as interfaces between topologically non-trivial and trivial matter that connects to high energy physics. Uh, it's like uh, uh, chiral, animal, I mean, this is fermion doubling problem without, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's like the, uh, 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 the chiral anomaly without the fermion doubling problem. Uh, so, uh, so in that case, you have to think of putting uh, sim say, let's say simulating uh, neutrinos, one has to put it on the boundary of a five-dimensional five universe, then you can have a projection on the boundary you can simulate uh, a, 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 a gapless fermion. So in this case, it's similar that this gapless fermion, it's, uh, it's there because the vacuum has a trivial topology. So the QED uh, uh, vacuum is, I can think of the electron hole pair production as the, uh, it's a big, it's a vac I can think of vacuum as a band insulator with a large gap, and the gap is set by the uh, electron hole pair production in QED. So at the interface of vacuum, which is topologically trivial, and the topological insulator, uh, at the interface I have a fermion. Okay, so that's the, uh, so it is a two-dimensional, uh, new type of two-dimensional electron gas, and uh, now this gas, uh, so the uh, interesting property is that because of the spin momentum locking, these electrons cannot backscatter uh, because there is no available state for it to scatter. So for that reason, uh, if I make a thin film out of a topological insulator, uh, since they cannot take a U-turn, the resistive pro dominant resistive process is blocked, so it will show a dissipation-less flow. So this is another way, besides superconductivity, this would be another way to get dissipation-less less flow in, in uh, condensed matter. So one can intentionally break the time reversal symmetry, then the Dirac fermion will be go gone, and then one will develop a regular band structure with parabolic bands. So, uh, so uh, another aspect is that the quantum Hall effect, it's, uh, you need a magnetic field and a, and a low temperature to, to, get the, to observe the topological effect. On topological insulators, you can, as we showed, you can observe it at room, room temperature without magnetic field. So from the application uh, point of view, uh, 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 it's less restrictive. Uh, you don't have to work at low temperature, uh, and you can work without magnetic field. So, I'm, uh, so let me provide a global perspective of uh, topological states in nature. The two-dimensional topological insulators, uh, you need cryogenics and uh, magnetic field or without it and high purity crystal. In three dimensions, you have an extreme form. First of all, it's a new state. Uh, you can play uh, with this state at room temperature, no magnetic field, and you don't need high, high purity crystals to observe the topological effect. But uh, perhaps the most exciting thing is that you can turn these materials into magnets and superconductors. 
and, uh, and that's most of condensed matter physics. So, so for the first time, we, we are getting to a frontier where we can study the interplay of topological order and the broken symmetry order. So this is a very exciting frontier. And some of these materials have already uh, demonstrated to, ha I mean, th they can be turned into superconductors and magnets. And, let, uh, and these, uh, the, the outcome of these interplays are very exciting. You could, uh, there are all these, uh, there are many theoretical predictions about their exotic behavior when you form these interfaces with superconductors and topological insulators, you could get fractional, uh, uh, fractional uh, emergent particles like Majorana particle or uh, uh, image monopoles and uh, various other exotic objects. So this is sort of the frontier aspect, uh, aspect that uh, the topological order and uh, superconductivity and magnetism, uh, they're merging. And one can utilize these interfaces to, uh, to develop uh, different uh, 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 devices with different functionalities. So one key functionality would be to get this dissipationless current. So I'm close to my, uh, this is my conclusion slide. So what I showed is that in a three-dimensional topological insulator, I have a chiral surface state. And if I take a one-dimensional cut, I get the spin hull state. But what if the universe string theorists are right and the universe has higher dimension? How would a four-dimensional topological insulator look like? So now I can straightforwardly generalize so then my, the, my spins will point in all uh, three dimensions. So it will look like a hedgehog. Uh, so that's four plus one D uh, uh, space. So I, we even have a name for it. We, we could call it not spin hull effect, but hedgehog, hedgehog effect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zahid, very much. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. Yes, please. Theoretically, people have shown that, but of course, in experiments, we have to, if we can find a, if we can find a, a real material that has Fermi surface like this, that would be some evidence of uh, the fourth dimension, right? So, well, I mean, we, can, we could try, keep looking, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, please. You have shown that there is a relation between the winding number of the spin. In this case, the winding number can be any integer, but here we have only two states. So is, it, is there a simple way to understand it? Uh, it's, uh, since it involves, uh, so the idea is it's a more of a heuristic argument that in the churn number case, I can have all possible integers, right? and it involves an integration over the entire bulk band structure. And in this case, the churn number is zero, right, in the spin orbit, uh, it's, it's because I always have a counter magnetic field, effective magnetic field, so the churn number is zero. So only way to construct a topological invariant of the available band structure is through the parity of the block state. So instead of churn number, I have to think of parity. And as you know, parity only comes in two values. Uh, so, uh, so that's the limitation. Yeah. Okay. Alec? To study this experimentally, this surface states, uh, do you have really good enough material to walk that you can ignore the, the, the yeah, that is, a, that is a good point. Uh, so far, uh, these materials are grown in a uh, just uh, regular solid state method. They're not 
um, MB grown high quality crystals. So people are getting there, but uh, even in the solid, uh, I have another slide that we are now, the materials I showed in this slide, they're, they're, uh, they're flat. And now there's new topological insulators we have found. They're much more bulk resistive. So in this new compounds, which I did not show data of, you can see the states in transport. Yeah, this is unpublished results. Uh, uh, I can tell you the name of the compound. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, a BTS-221. There is a compound, bismuth-based, where it naturally comes very, very insulating. So the, in this case, if you do transport, then 50% signal comes from the surface. And in other materials I showed in transport, uh, only 0.5% signal comes from surf, uh, surface. Yeah. So this is kind of a breakthrough, if you like, for, for the transport community. And these, in these new materials, the uh, mobility is also much, uh, much more enhanced, uh, 30,000 in that range, 30 to 50,000, so which is like better than early graphene. So maybe one last question, David? Well, a follow-up on that. Um, since most of the materials that have been studied do have full conduction, can you speak about the robustness of the surface gauge in the presence of bulk? All of the discussion um, about the topological and of the state involves uh, not having the bulk conduction, but uh, the surface that you and others actually study. Yeah. So uh, uh, in, in real materials, there is always, if there is a bulk channel, there is surface bulk coupling. So you'll see that the lifetime is short because of that scattering, right? So uh, the fact that uh, these new materials, I'm claiming that they have uh, high mobility is based on that direct measurement, how much surface... Uh, Lifetime is shortened by surface bulk scattering, and uh, this is a, this panel B. Somehow my pointer is not working. This panel B is you can see the lifetime is very large, so that means in this case the bulk uh, carrier is really reduced. We can see that in the spectroscopic signal that the lifetime has gone up when the bulk uh, carrier is down. Uh, uh, and the second part of your question is that uh, uh, it's signal to noise issue unless if your bulk residual bulk carrier is non-magnetic, it should be fine. Like in these new materials, the 50% signal is from surface. It's still fine as long as the residual carrier is non-magnetic. That will maintain the time reversal invariant character of the state, and this state should be robust against disorder. So we're getting to a regime where we can finally really check those ideas. So this is an exciting new frontier. Okay, let's uh, thank Zahid once again. I'd like to uh, just remind you of a few things. Uh, uh, please participate in the ballot elections for uh, Igal Meir as our new president uh, as you walk outside. Grab a quick coffee and some pastry and go immediately up to the uh, Exact Sciences building. If you have a poster, this is a good time to put it up. The uh, posters are numbered. Go and put your poster in the uh, right place. <laughs>